Hello, meat lovers. Thank you for joining us once again. Today we're dealing once again with recidivist defenders. Once again, it's Brad Stansfield, a medical doctor, fellow New Zealander, um, although I think he should hand his card in, frankly. Um, this is a bloke who is clearly quite uh, sympathetic to vegan ideals, whether he's a vegan himself or not, I don't know and I don't care. This is a bloke whose videos I've dealt with in the past. Basically, his problem is Dunning-Kruger. He, he thinks his medical qualification makes him competent to speak about science in general, and he thinks that citing a few so-called science papers makes his argument any good. Let's see if it is. Uh, spoiler. No. Right. Uh, he does have good points, of course, and he starts with a good point. The first point he's making being, as soon as I can get my mouse to work, there it is, that there is no such thing as good and bad cholesterol. That's the title of his video. It's good, Brad. It's good. You should have just stopped there. Never mind. Anyway, let's deal with it. There is no such thing as bad or good cholesterol. Today we're debunking myths and going through what you need to do to protect your heart. Cholesterol is a waxy, bat-like substance that's found in all cells in the body. Your body needs this cholesterol to make hormones, vitamin D and help to digest your foods. But there's a problem. Cholesterol doesn't mix with blood. Think of trying to mix oil and water. That's not a problem. We have lipoproteins that mean that the cholesterol can be delivered to where it needs to be in the blood. So no, it's not a problem, Brad. It's evolved a solution. Great, isn't it? Nature's wonderful. It doesn't work and they separate out. Instead, the cholesterol is packaged up into vehicles called lipoprotein. Right, so there is no problem. Good. So LDL, or low-density lipoprotein, simply refers to the density of the cholesterol that's packaged... No, it doesn't. The cholesterol is identical, irrespective of the lipoprotein carrying it, Brad. Wrong. The density variability is expressed by the lipoprotein, not the cholesterol. Into that lipoprotein. The cholesterol structure itself is exactly the same, whether it's trans- Well, there you go. ...sported in a high-density lipoprotein or- a So be a bit more careful about how you speak, Brad. Choose your words carefully. A low-density lipoprotein. The cholesterol itself doesn't cause heart disease. Bam! There you go. Neither does the lipoprotein, by the way, Brad. Instead, it's the concentration of the cholesterol-carrying lipoproteins in the... False. There is no evidence extant anywhere in the literature that can support that ridiculous claim. Cause and effect requires experimental work. Period. That is the scientific discipline. Whether you like it or not, Brad, it is impossible to get that data practically, ethically, and financially. Ergo, we will be stuck permanently with people who want to have opinions on this, hypotheses. And you've just given us one. You've just said the cause of heart disease is an elevated level of low-density lipoprotein, Brad, and you're wrong. It is nothing of the sort. False. Blood that really matter. And here comes the yelling from the keto and carnivore influencers who will say things like cholesterol-carrying lipoproteins don't matter. What matters is insulin resistance. Insulin resistance is a construct. And it's no more the answer to the underlying etiology of atherosclerotic disease burden than is lipoprotein concentration, Brad. That's wrong too. And your overall metabolic health. They'll bring up- What does that mean, overall metabolic health? Operationally define that for us, Brad. Graphs like this one showing that low, low-density lipoprotein levels are associated with higher death rates and the ideal LDL cholesterol level is 140 milligrams per deciliter. And here's another chart collected by two fairly well-known organizations. This is independent data sets put together on one chart by someone clever. Uh, this is World Health Organization versus British Heart Foundation data on people's cholesterol levels and their mortality rates. And I think about 168 countries and territories around the world, probably billions and billions of person years of follow-up here, almost certainly. It's a much larger data set than the one that Brad's got here, and it suggests, actually, that the so-called optimal, or that level which is associated with the lowest level of mortality, is 220 milligrams per deciliter, Brad, not 140. And in fact, the upward inflection beyond the nadir point is actually not informed by enough data points to make it statistically convincing. So there's actually not really any evidence that there really is an uptick above a certain level either to speak of. But that's for another day. Now, the stakes are high. We absolutely need to get this right. 
so that we can prevent heart attacks and strokes. Right, so the first thing to do then, Brad, to get it right and to protect people is stop making claims that are not supported by science, which you've done here already in this video. You said that LDL concentration is important causally in the development of the atherosclerotic disease process, and it is not, Brad. This is not to be trifled with. So let's unpack this myth step by step. Firstly, this is an observational study, so all the authors did was simply observe the population to see what trends they could see. Well, yes, that's what most studies revolving around cholesterol do because of the difficulties and ethical blockades, as well as the financial practicalities and all of that, and getting decent research done in this field. So yes, Brad has got this bit right. Correlation does not equal causation. So ergo, you cannot state that LDL cholesterol concentration is an important factor in the development of heart disease causally. Good, Brad. How do you still get this so wrong? But correlation doesn't equal causation. Instead, what's happening is that these low levels of LDL cholesterol are largely a marker of severe disease. Oh, right. Reverse causality, you say. Okay. Who cares? Even if, even if reverse causality is correct here, who cares? This is not a causal relationship. Okay? Essentially, when a population is observed, those who have got chronic diseases, such as cancer or chronic kidney disease, they often have low levels of LDL cholesterol. And so? Instead, we know that when we actively intervene and lower a person's LDL cholesterol levels, we lower the rates of heart disease. And we don't know that, actually, meaningfully at all, Brad. That is an incompetent reading of the empirical inference available in the body of literature on this topic. So they have pharmacologically reduced people's LDL here in this so-called study, and the pharmacological agents that reduce LDLC also have the serendipitous effect of reducing inflammation. There are anti-inflammatory properties to both the PSK9 inhibitors and also the uh, the statins as well confounded so we're done with this still and we know this from randomized controlled trials okay well they're the two words that are most often abused i think in science well they're both in second place i think probably the worst most misused word in people talking about science is risk but control and randomization are, are two words that are often used to describe clinical studies which are loosely controlled at best and poorly randomized, almost universally as well. So no, Brad, no. Cue more yelling from the keto and carnivore influencers who will say that those results are explained by reduced inflammation levels. There you go. That when we actively lower a person's LDL cholesterol levels, we're also lowering their inflammation, and it's the lower inflammation levels that are responsible for the lower cardiovascular disease. There you go. Correct. It's got nothing to do with the LDL cholesterol levels. Correct. So let's address that point. We have a massive trial called the PISA study, P-E-S-A, and it enrolled over 4,000 individuals. That's not a massive study, Brad. See, a scientist knows that. Who underwent three yearly examinations. All oh, right. Well, that's very granular, isn't it? So now you want to tell us all about the causes of people's health outcomes on the basis of checking in with them on a three yearly basis? No, Brad. Looking for blockages in their blood vessels. No, Brad. That's not what the study did at all. Have you even read the study, Brad? What they found is that for people that had optimal values for their cardiovascular risk factor. According to whom? So they were insulin sensitive. That what does that mean? That's a construct. They were at the perfect weight. They had low level. A bit construct as well. Of inflammation. They were How was that measured and ratified? And every three years? There's still a significant correlation. Between Significant is a statistical statement, Brad. It refers to parsimoniously. It refers to the likelihood that any given finding has occurred due to dumb chance. It has nothing whatsoever to do with clinical meaning, utility or value to a population or even any given individual person within that population. This is noise. When LDL cholesterol levels and the presence of blockages in blood vessels. No. The study did not look at blockages in the blood vessels, Brad. And we can see this quite clearly on the graph. So I don't know how many million times I've covered this graph, but let's cover the three most salient arguments which dismiss this graph as being of any utility. Again, one, look at the left-hand end of the chart here. N equals two. So we can ignore that. The next one is N equals nine. 
So we can probably ignore that one as well. It's not till you get to the third one that you have n equals 41, which is still not going to convince me of anything, actually. Overall, what we have here is an association. Association does not equal causation. Brad, where have I heard that before? Where have I heard that before very recently? I wonder. And no statistical power, no causal data. This is, this is associative. And what is it that's being associated? What was measured in this study? It was the number of sites where any evidence of atherosclerotic lesioning could be detected at any level. What the hell kind of metric is that? It certainly isn't a metric of blockage at all. It's a, it's a measurement of how many sites of atherosclerosis were visible at any size, big or small. This is not even a metric of anything. So, to summarize, no statistical power, no cause and effect inference here. This is associative, and the metric is nonsensical. We're done with this one. Good try, though, Brad. Uh, perhaps when you've actually got some scientific nous and qualifications, you might come back and do a better job on the interwebs. In the meantime, I suggest you go and be a medic, because that's what you're qualified to do. You're not qualified to be a scientist, so you should stop trying to be one. Okay? Rough. Whereas the LDL cholesterol levels increase, so too does the... Ch Tested every three years? So we have really no idea of the exposure to cholesterol over time. I mean, that one where it's got, let's say, the very highest one, 150 to 160 milligrams per deciliter, I assume that is, 163 participants in that group. Can we see the records of their repeated measurements of LDL on a daily basis or a weekly basis at least over the entire follow-up period of the study so that they can actually tell us what the exposure to cholesterol actually was? Repeatability, reliability of measurement, Brad. It's another thing you learn about when you're a scientist. What's next? Chance of developing blockages in our blood vessels. Again, what this trial tells us is even if you- There's absolutely nothing, Brad. You've been taken in by pseudoscience precisely because you are not competent to read science. Your training is, is as an allopathic physician in my understanding. Go and do that. You don't have insulin resistance if you construct you have low levels of inflammation and you are how is that measured are a perfect weight according to whom you can still develop blockages in your blood vessels if the concentration of the cholesterol carrying lipoproteins is high enough and maybe not too so not causal agent then good and when you lower that concentration as evidenced by the randomized controlled trials. Uh, no, again, see there's, there's those, use, those, those words that are used inappropriately there, randomized and controlled. Neither of those things have been done remotely well enough in the study to call it a randomized control trial. And how have they done it? They've done it pharmacologically using agents which do have an anti-inflammatory effect. Brad, okay? You lower your chance of blockages in your blood vessel. No, that study on those people refers to what happened in the past under the circumstances that those people were living at that time. It does not project anything into the future for any other group of people, let alone any individual. Me, you just told me my risk is affected by that study, which it isn't. Okay? Risk is a cause and effect statement, Brad. There is no cause and effect data extant. Still. You lower the chance of heart attacks. No. And strokes. No. Now, one criticism of the PISA study. I gave three. Let's see how many of them you get. Is that in the very low LDL cholesterol group. One. There was only two participants. Well done, Bradley. Good. So you can ignore it. It's nonsense. This is because without using medications. Who cares why it is? There is not enough data there to make that point worthwhile putting on the chart. It's rubbish. It's propaganda, Brad. It's almost impossible to reach these low levels of LDL cholesterol. <sighs> Wow, it's almost impossible to reach levels that low without intervening pharmacologically. Perhaps that would suggest that the levels shouldn't be that low because, well, let's face it, we've survived a very, very long time, haven't we, Brad, as a species, without chugging down PSK9 inhibitors and statins and the like. Maybe our body knows more about this than you do, based on your complete lack of understanding of science, Brad. You have to have won the genetic lottery. so it's very How is that winning anything? Having a lower level of LDL, there is no evidence to suggest LDL is problematic. Very rare to have LDL cholesterol levels this low. However, as the numbers of participants increase, again, you can quite clearly see the trend. Whereas L the trend of what? The trend of number of sites of any degree of apparent lesioning whatsoever of any size, giving us no idea of severity or progression of disease in people whatsoever. 
a useless metric, Brad. LDL cholesterol levels increase. So too do the chances. No. See, there you go again. Chances. No. No. This is a retrospective analysis of what was observed in those people at that time under the conditions those people lived, which wasn't controlled. In fact, Brad, these were people free living under their own recognizance, not science. Developing blockages in our blood vessels. And taken together, this supports the idea that the lower your LDL cholesterol levels are, the better. As uh, no, it doesn't support that, though, at all, Brad. This is pseudoscientific claptrappery, crack pottery, and basically unforgivable incompetence, both from the authors of this paper and the people that decided it should be published, and also yourself, son, because you don't understand it either, clearly. In, the more protected you are against heart attacks and strokes. Nonsense. There is no evidence to support that ridiculous claim anywhere, and certainly not in this paper. So how does a high concentration of low-density lipoprotein particles cause blockages in our blood vessels? It doesn't. Like I mentioned earlier, correlation doesn't equal causation. We need to have a firm mechanism for how LDL particles can cause blockages in our blood vessels. And then we need to subject that proposed mechanistic speculation to a test of how it occurs experimentally to establish it. Have we done that, Brad? Shall we wait for that? No, we don't have that. This is a mechanistic speculation. And this was explained beautifully by the European Atherosclerosis Society. Oh, right, yes. Yes, of course. Of course, the European atherosclerosis people, the fine, fine folks who were not paid a single cent whatsoever by any statin-producing companies to put together a theology that looks remotely, maybe pseudoscientific, so that people who are stupid enough to be sucked in by it, like Brad Stansfield, are sucked in by it, and then mindlessly regurgitate that. Because you repeat a lie often enough, it becomes truth, doesn't it? So uh, I wonder how much money was paid to these people by statin producing companies to come up with this particular graph here, this mechanistic speculation. Shall we have a look? Let's have a look at the conflict of interest statement that was required from these people when they published their articles. Here it is. <laughs> Good. Shall we move on now and, and see whether there's any actual science here at all? They explain that LDL particles, they don't just passively move across blood vessel walls. Instead, there are specific pathways to cross the blood vessel walls. So? And this is called transcytosis. Yep. So? The take-home message before we move on to the next point is that if the LDL particles reach a certain concentration, even if you are metabolically healthy, you are insulin sensitive and you've got a perfect weight, you can still develop blockages in your blood vessels. And, and you can still develop those with very, very low cholesterol levels as well. Because, Brad, LDL is not a causal agent here. It's an association, and it's not even a very good association. It's actually piss weak at best. When you understand statistics, you'll be able to see that. Perhaps when you've done some actual scientific training, Brad. And or even better, go and be a physician. Go and do that. It's not the cholesterol itself. It's the concentration of the cholesterol-carrying lipoproteins. No, it isn't. There is no evidence to support that claim either. That really matters. No, it isn't, Brad. But lipoprotein concentration isn't the only factor that we need to worry about. We still have to address all of the other risk factors, including insulin resistance, blood... Which is still a construct. Sugar levels, infl yeah, inflammation, how are you going to measure that? Inflammation, blood pressure, weight. See, see, look, there are one, two, three, four things on that list there that can actually be measured. And there's one that's a construct. All of those risk factors, including like risk factor. No, risk is a cause and effect statement. It requires cause and effect evidence. 
when you don't have cause and effect evidence, you cannot claim something as a risk factor. It's an associate and not a very good one. For protein concentrations need to be addressed to reduce our chance of heart attacks. No, not at all. So coming back to lipoproteins, which lipoproteins do we need to worry about? None of them. They're all there, Brad, because they exist according to some genes that can be up or down regulated according to the evil machinations of the body, which knows what it's doing. Those genes have been around for oh, pff, at least 3.8 billion years, okay? Uh, and probably longer than that, I would suspect, but that's for another day. We all did fine before, well, little boys in white coats who think themselves clever were running around telling people that, well, running around saying uh, correlation does not equal causality and then turning around and claiming causality anyway, Brad. Stunning. Absolutely stunning that you would be that vacuous, that unaware of what you are even saying. Wow! Because on a regular lipid blood panel, you'll see LDL cholesterol. Which is actually an estimate, Brad, and not measured. Do you know that even? Do you even know how this is done in a laboratory? Hmm? It's an estimate, Brad. That's a measure of the amount no, of- No, it isn't. It's an estimate, <laughs> for goodness sake. Of cholesterol that the LDL particles are carrying. It doesn't actually measure the number or concentration of the LDL particles. And That's right. It's an estimate. It's not just LDL particles that contribute to blockages in our blood vessels. But they don't contribute, Bradley. No. There are different types of LDL particles, such as small dense LDL, oxidized LDL, and there's lipoprotein little a, just to name a few. So just relying on LDL cholesterol is an incomplete marker. Ideally, if my patients have the resources to fund it, I encourage them to check their ApoB levels. Another associate this week, at best, Brad, and not a causal agent in the disease process, still. ApoB is a primary protein component of lipoproteins that cause issues with respect to our blood vessels. No, they don't, Brad. No, they don't. It's the ApoB family of lipoproteins that can be retained in our blood vessel walls, again leading to blockages. False, Bradley. The blockage that you will find in an atherosclerosis sufferer is almost entirely construed of scar tissue, not cholesterol or lipoproteins or any fraction of the lipoproteins, okay? You'll hear some people talking about oxidized LDL or small dense LDL, that those are the ones to worry about. None of them are to worry about. Lipoproteins do not cause atherosclerosis to occur. That has been debunked. It's the concentration of the ApoB containing lipoproteins that really matters. No, it isn't. Supply us with some evidence to the contrary, Brad. Shall we wait? False. And for my patients that I see at the clinic, we aim for- Why don't you just go and do that, Brad? Go and see your patients. That is what you are qualified to do. I would suggest to any of my fellow Kiwis who might be patients of Brad Stansfield, you probably want to reconsider that, frankly. Brad is spouting what is thought generally by the medical fraternity to be the indicated and appropriate line of reasoning and action. So he's not out of step with his colleagues so much. What he is out of step with is reality, the objective reality in which we find ourselves. He's out of step with his own level of competence as a scientist, which is none. None at all. And he's out of step with the Hippocratic Oath, which requires him to first do no harm. Artificially lowering a person's lipoprotein level or cholesterol level, or both, in their blood is contraindicated. It's next. For ApoB levels below 60 milligrams per deciliter. Based on what? Which experiment, which, which properly controlled, properly randomized, properly powered, properly tenured experiment on human beings under lock and key in a laboratory situation, can you back that claim up with Brad? Shall we wait? But as mentioned earlier, there are costs involved in measuring your ApoB levels. So if we have to rely on LDL cholesterol levels alone, we still target a level below 60 milligrams per deciliter. Based on what? Same argument as previously. Where is your experimental data, Bradley? Now you'll notice that that level is significantly less compared to the American Heart Association. Appeal to authority fallacy. Who cares what this organization here has to say? 
It's your funeral. If you want to listen to some self-claimed authority on their position statement, that's your business. You go ahead. I will rely personally on empirical scientific evidence to make my decisions about what's likely best for me. Guidelines. And I'll reference the PISA study again. Yeah, well, we've dealt with this thing already, haven't we? So let's bring it up again. We won't need to go through it again because we've already dealt with it. Done. Because we can see that if the LDL cholesterol levels are above 60, that's when it seems that atherosclerosis or blockages in our blood vessels can occur. Nonsense. The next question is why don't we pay that much attention to the HDL cholesterol levels that are also commonly measured on a standard lipid blood test? It used to be thought that by raising the concentration of HDL particles, we could be protected against heart disease. Unfortunately, those studies failed. And th because LDL wasn't the cause in the first place, so why would HDL fix it? Good. <laughs> ah, logics. Logics, though. It's brilliant stuff, isn't it? That's why clinicians instead focus on ApoB levels. So how Falsely. How do we lower ApoB-containing lipoprotein? Who cares? It's contraindicated. You shouldn't do that. Your genes control the level of your lipoproteins, Brad. Those genes reacting to the environment in which you place them at any given time. You don't need to worry about it. You don't need to intervene. We certainly don't need any advice from non-scientifically qualified young men in white coats who think themselves competent in fields that they're not. Certainly not. Proteins. Well, we always start with diet. And we don't just want to focus on a diet that lowers ApoB levels. We don't want to do that at all. Ideally, we want a diet that also helps to lower blood pressure and lower our weight. So those two things, absolutely, yeah. To provide a quick summary, we want a whole food. So, okay, chicken there, good, that's food. The garnish, well, okay, garnish is garnish. Probably best avoid it if you possibly can. The stuff before that, on the scene beforehand, with the other plates of plant-based non-food slop. That's all we need to know about Brad Stanfield. Not only does he have... No idea of training in science at all whatsoever, cause and effect, proof of anything. He also clearly doesn't understand nutrition, which is not surprising because he's not a nutritionist. He's an allopathic physician and should go and do that. High protein diet, but the proteins that we select should be lean, as in low saturated False. Absolutely false. Saturated fat. We no, you should not be avoiding saturated fat at all. This Hooper study here is one of five major meta-analyses with multi-million person years of follow-up available on this topic. One of those five found a statistically significant finding, which was of no clinical utility anyway because its actual magnitude was so close to zero as makes no odds. It was statistically significant because of the sample size. The other four did not even find a statistical difference. So on balance, of the five major meta-analyses available on this topic for saturated fat and cardiovascular disease, the result is clear, and it is that there is no meaningful association between those factors. Can we move on now, Brad? You clearly can't for some reason. I don't understand why you can't. That's the empirical data. That's what it says. Know from a Cochrane review that as we lower our saturated fat intake, we lower the chance of heart attacks. No, we don't, because no associative study can inform on risk, chances, odds, or hazard. They are all cause and effect statements requiring a mechanism which is established with empirical, scientific, experimental work, Brad. Shall we wait for that to be provided? Still no? Mm. Unbelievable, isn't it, kids? And a quick note that saturated fat is different to dietary cholesterol. So for most... Oh, of course it is. It's not the same stuff. Patients, dietary cholesterol that's commonly found in things like eggs doesn't have a huge impact on our blood cholesterol levels. It's the saturated fat that increases our blood lipoprotein concentrations. Because... That saturated fat is useful, our body needs it, and it needs to be transported to the cells so that the cells can use it for their purposes. That's why the LDL goes up when you eat more saturated fat. It's supposed to happen, Brad. We also want to focus on high-fiber foods. No, we don't. Fiber is contraindicated in the human colon. Because, again from Cochrane, we can see that as we increase our fiber intake, we lower our total and LDL cholesterol. Which is contraindicated. We don't want to do that, Brad. Levels. And in terms of blood pressure, we want to be consuming high potassium foods such as beans, lentils, avocados, spinach, broccoli, and peas. Or indeed, we don't want to be doing that, in fact, because uh, potassium is not the best way to control your blood pressure. And of course, we want to be exercising. Now, if diet and exercise... Oh, now you're an exercise physiologist as well, are you, Brad? I am, by the way, among other things. 
exercise physiologist, nutritionist, and cardiovascular pathophysiologist. Brad, okay, you're not. Aren't enough. There are a myriad of cholesterol-lowering medications that Which we can use. So make sure to check out this next video here on the medication that I use in addition to diet and exercise to lower my cholesterol levels. Goodness gracious, Brad, at your age, thinking for a second that you need to pharmacologically intervene in what your body is doing according to the instructions in your genes, those genes having survived, well, four, four and a half million years in, the, in a basically human format or nearly human format. The arrogance of you, son. The Dunning-Kruger that drips from every pore of your body, son. Who do you think you are exactly? Wow. Right, there you go. Brad Stansfield. Absolutely wrong. Completely wrong on every assertion of any meaning or, uh, or, or, or value that he's made there in his video. Absolute, rancid, pustulous gobshite from start to finish from an absolutely unconscious and competent individual. I really, really suggest you knock this on the head, Brad. You are out of your depth. You are misguiding people. You are giving very, very poor information to people. You are in breach of the Hippocratic Oath, which requires you to first do no harm. I know that New Zealand physicians don't necessarily have to state the Hippocratic Oath or anything like that, but the concept, the concept applies. Your first responsibility is not to intervene where it's not required. And in the case of lipoproteins, it is not required. It's contraindicated. Knock it off. Right. The rest of you, join me next time when someone will be wrong on interwebs because it doesn't look like slowing down anytime soon. See you then. Ciao.